with you to God's house. I hope that you do. If you don't have a Bible, if you'll see me immediately following service, I'll give you a Bible, and it can be yours to keep. You can put your name in it uh, and bring it to uh, God's house every time. This morning, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 21. All right, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 21. And I picked this simply because I asked God uh, to give me something that would align with what we will be celebrating over the next couple weeks as we move into our Easter celebration, okay? And so uh, I basically just went back a chapter right before that Jesus comes in. You say, Jody, what are you going to preach about next week? I'm going to preach about the King is coming because that's exactly what happened, okay? On Palm Sunday, uh, the men and women aligned themselves in the streets and they began to lay out uh, the palm branches, their clothing, uh, in celebration of Christ's coming. And so uh, the Bible tells us over in the Old Testament, it was prophesied, the king is coming. And really and truthfully, it happened. The king came, and we'll celebrate that next week. But I went back a few verses in the scripture to see kind of what it was that Jesus was doing before he came into Jerusalem, which we will celebrate next week. And I found in Matthew chapter 21, where the Bible says when they drew nigh to Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage and to the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a coat with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. The message this morning is being set free. Freedom. It's something that we all enjoy. Citizens of our great nation, we know what it means to be free. You say, well, preacher, this isn't July 4th. You've got the wrong holiday. This is the wrong celebration. No, give me a chance this morning, my friend. I'm telling you that there are millions of souls today that are still in bondage. They are still wrapped up in their own self-righteousness, wrapped up in their own sins, wrapped up in the busyness of chasing after the accumulation of things in this life. Wrapped up in busy schedules, wrapped up in distractions that are keeping them from realizing how far removed they are from a relationship with God. As I drove to church this morning, I noticed some work that was about to commence and take place at this particular house. And I, as I drove, or actually it was a place of business, and as I drove by, and I seen that work that was going to be done, I thought to myself, here is a guy, I knew the guy, and I said, here is a guy that's about my age, I'm on my way to the house of God to lift up and proclaim the name of Jesus and to praise him for all that he has done for me, and here's a guy that's getting ready to start a work day, has no desire to be in God's house. And it's sad in the sense that I don't judge him over myself or judge me over him. What I was hurt by the most is that he was just going through life as if there was no reason to celebrate today. He was going through life as if there's no need for a church. There's no no need for a Jesus. There's no need for forgiveness. There's no need for salvation. There's no need to be baptized. Why would I need to do that? Look at what I've got. I can go out here today and work and I can get the more. I can put more money in my wallet. I, I can provide for my family. I can do all these things. And while he's doing that, he is forsaking the assembling of himself together with the followers of Christ. And so the Bible says that we find that these two animals were tied up. 
<laughs> we see that still in our world today, but in the Old Testament times, we have this ass, we have this donkey and a coat tied up. The Bible says they're tied up together, and here they are tied up, and Jesus said, I want you to go, and I want you to find that donkey and find that coat, and when you find them tied up, I want you to loose them and let them go. And when you do that, bring them to me. Don't, don't set them free, but set them free in the sense you're going to untie their bondage and bring them to me. I've got need of them. Well, we're coming to a point here in just a second where my friend Jesus might be saying that very same thing to you this morning. Well, the mission of Christ in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 Jesus said this, these are his own words, this was his own testimony, and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Somebody may say, why did Christ came? Why did Christ come to the earth? What was his mission? What was his purpose? Well, Jesus said, here's my purpose. I come to heal the brokenhearted. I come to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Two words in that testimony of the mission of Christ. Christ talks about freedom. He talks about being set free. He said, I come to preach deliverance to those that are captive and I come to set at liberty those that are bruised. Well, Jesus also would say, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you are free indeed. Free from what? Why talk about free? I don't understand, preacher. What is it that you're telling me I need to be free from? Well, the first step in any process to getting your life in order is an acknowledgement that you need to get your life in order. The first step in the right direction is to acknowledge that you're in the wrong direction. <laughs> the first step of getting in onto the right road is first acknowledging that you're on the wrong road. Amen? And so here you come to church this morning, and I, I, I'm just back to the basics of telling you there's two roads that you're living, one of those two. The Bible says there is a wide gate, a broad road that leads to destruction and a narrow way that leads to life everlasting. Whether you're young or old or somewhere in between, this morning under the sound of my voice, every one of us, we are on one of those two roads and you can't be on both at the same time. You can't be on a march to hell but at the same time making your way to heaven. You can't be on your way to heaven and also on your way to hell. The Bible says you're on one of the two roads. No man can serve two masters. You'll love Jesus or you'll hate him. You'll worship him or you'll curse him. And so let me tell you why we need to set free. We sing the song about being set free. What are we being set free from? From our sins. That has chained us. That has bound us. And that refuses to let go. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And one man of God commented on this verse and said, Let sinners attend to the Savior's invitation when liberty is thus proclaimed. So that you can be set free this morning as well. We've seen an example of it just last week here in God's house. You've seen it before. Some of you have experienced it before. I have. When you come to church and we sing and we fellowship and we pray and we preach and we do all of these things to worship the Lord and then all of a sudden the invitation is given for the lost souls to come and be saved. And we've seen a family. We didn't see one, we seen two. And I believe it will lead to the whole family. I pray that it does. I know that it can because the Bible says that it can. And we just preached a sermon and God showed us how that the jailer just a few weeks ago, he got saved in all of his household. And I believe that for Jacob and Kelly, not only have they gotten saved, and now this morning they will uh, show us that through baptism, showing to you what God has done for them and their faith that they have in the Lord, 
I believe that it could reach out and touch the whole family. Amen? Let sinners attend. And so they came. They came forward. And what did they do? They came to the only person who could set them free. You say, well, did they come to you? My friend, don't come to me. I can't do a thing for you. I mean, I, I have no power to get you into heaven no more than I've got a power to cast you into hell. I can't do anything for you. I can only be the mouthpiece for Almighty God that says, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and are heavy laden. And Jesus said, I'll give you rest. I'm just pointing to the person who can fix your problems this morning. I'm just pointing you in the direction of somebody who can save your soul. Don't come to me. Don't come to this church. Don't think just because you sat in a pew this morning that heaven has to be your home. That's not true. I'm pointing you in the direction of somebody who can set you free, who can give you a good night's sleep for a change. You say, I couldn't tell you how long it's been since I had one of those. Get your life right with the Lord. When you get your life right with the Lord, things change. And one of the first things that changes is you'll notice when your head hits the pillow, you can go to sleep. You say, well, what about all these things that are going on? That's all right. So did the prophet over in the Old Testament. The enemy encamped all around about him. And when he woke up that morning, his servant said, Alas, Master, we're doomed. And the man of God asked God would open the eyes of his servant. When the servant's eyes were opened, he seen that the chariots of God were outnumbered the enemy. You say, I can't get a good night's sleep. I'm afraid I'm going to die and go to hell. Well, why don't you come and let the sun set you free this morning? For whom the sun sets free, he's free indeed. I got tangled up yesterday. Somebody, we were at the baseball field and somebody had taken a baseball, taken the leather cover off of it. And if you've ever taken the leather cover off of a baseball, you'll find that there's several feet of yarn, string that's wrapped around the rubber ball. And then they put the leather on it and then they seam it up, sew it up with the seams and therefore we have a baseball. But somebody had taken the leather cover off and, and they had unraveled the, the yarn. As I got up, and, and, and I'm, a, I'm nervous. I, I can't sit still. I mean, I, I want us to hit a home run every time. I want us to strike them out every time. I, I don't want them to get, I don't want the enemy to get, I don't want them to get a hit. I want every game to be a no hitter. I want it to be a boy. I, I show no mercy. And you say, do you act like that? Just a little. <laughs> a little. And I got up, and one of the 500 times that I got up, and I got, I got, I got my feet caught up in that yarn that some kid had thrown down as if it was nothing. But it about tripped up a middle-aged man and caused me the awfulest mess there ever was. And, and I tried to get one foot out of it. And, and when I took one foot out, the other foot got caught in it. And, and you know what I was? I, I, I was bound up. The more I tried, the more I tried, the more I, I was in a mess. And... And that's no different than all of us who are running from the Lord as if he doesn't know where we are. We're getting bound up and the more we try to fix it, the worse it gets. Proverbs chapter 5, the wise man said, his own iniquities, the person's own sin, man's own sin shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction. In the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. This is a sad verse this morning in God's Word. And do you know what that verse means? It means that we can get tangled up in sin, and the longer we stay in it, the tighter the bonds get, and the tighter the string is tied. And the tape is wrapped and before you know it, we've lived our whole life and now we are chained to Satan. And the Bible says, the end result is that man shall die without instruction and in the greatness of his folly, I hate to tell you, but what that means is he shall go to hell. And that's a terrible outcome. 
That's why Benson said this. Through his stupendous folly. Look at it. Right there in your outline, in the top, on the right page. Through his stupendous or astonishing folly. The worst decision that could be made. This man has cheated himself with the hopes of repentance and impunity and exposed himself to endless torments for the momentary pleasures of gratifying sinful lust. And because he chose the world, he shall go astray. He will never belong to God because he always belonged to the world. He will never belong in heaven because he was always bound to hell. Isn't that a sad story? I don't want that to be you. I don't want it to be me. I don't want it to be your family. And I don't want it to be my family. We ought to pray every day. God, would you save those that are lost? Would you enlighten the hearts of those that are condemned? Would you show forth your way? Would you allow us to be the light as a city that sits on a hill that shines out to a lost and dying world? Why? So that they may see our good works and glorify you. So that they might be rescued from their bondage. Freed from their sins. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, Stand therefore, stand fast therefore in the freedom, in the liberty, wherewith Christ has made you free. And don't get entangled again. Get away from it. Get away from it. I've heard people say all the time, I'm not going back there. Every time I go back there, something bad happens. I'm not going to hang out with those people anymore. Every time I think they're a bad influence on me, I, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, going, I'm not coming back to Perry County. I'm not coming back to Hazard. Well, maybe that needs to be the case. I don't know. But before you start casting everybody off, I'm telling you it won't do you no good to run until you first come to Jesus. I don't care where you live, without Jesus, you're still going to be bound. You can go to the furthest stretches of the earth and running from your problems, but you can't run far enough. Wherever you go, you'll find your sin. Wherever you go, you'll find your problem. Wherever you go, you'll find your bondage. The only place I can point you to this morning is to point you to the cross. And there on the cross was the Savior of the world who shed His blood, His innocent blood. And it flowed down that cross. Why? Because He knew one day you would be covered in your sins and you would need to be set free. And He would be able to send a man of God that would stand in a pulpit and open the Scripture and point to the cross and say, Come to Jesus. That's the only freedom you got. It's the only hope you've got. Jesus, well, let me say this. On Wednesday nights, we have learned this more than anything. If you're not participating with us on midweek service, you should. We're getting smarter. Don't be a Bible dummy. All right, we open up God's Word and we study from it. Don't be biblical dummies. The Bible says we err because we don't know the Scripture. We falter and we fail simply because we don't know the Scripture. So we gather every Wednesday night. Why? We're going to study the Word of God. And in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, the Bible says that Christians are no longer slaves to sin. We are no longer bound in our sin. We are no longer servants of sinful pleasures. We have escaped that, not on our own power, but God has rescued us. You think I'm bad in in, in Christ. Imagine what I'd be without Him. Amen? Hey, I stumble and for goodness sakes, I'm the worst of the bunch. Here in just a few minutes, you'll see two more that, that... are coming to, what do I say, Bruce? Our our circus. Welcome to the circus, and I'm the what? I'm the ringleader. Listen, I'd be a mess. Without Christ, where would I be? I'd be a mess. You say, you're bad enough as it is. I know. I know where I'd be without Christ. I know where I'd be without salvation. I know where I'd be without a church family. I know. I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I know this. I'm smart enough to know that I can't do it without Christ. Amen. Let me give you one last story. 
and we're going to take two into water baptism, and I'm so excited about that, and I hope it encourages somebody that's here this morning that's made Jesus Christ the Lord of their life, and if they've not been baptized, I, I hope they come in their Sunday duds and say, I don't want to wait another week. I just want to get baptized right now. Amen? Jesus raises Lazarus. We all know this story. John chapter 11, the Bible says that he took away the stone from the place where Lazarus was laid. The Bible says actually the dead was laid. He took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. How do we know he was dead? Well, a couple of reasons we know Lazarus was dead. First of all, he took his last breath four days prior. All right, you say, well, how long can the body go without oxygen? Well, just a few seconds. Now, the Bible says that he had been gone for four days, dead for four days. Matter of fact, when Jesus wanted to remove the stone from the grave site, you know what his sister said? Oh, Lord, don't do that. Why? The body stinks. Don't take away the stone. He's been dead for four days. The natural decay has already started. That body stinketh by now. Don't do it, Lord. The Bible says, When he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, speaking of Jesus. And he said three words, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. I, I can only imagine Lazarus who'd been dead for four days. And here he was, he looked like a mummy. I mean, just picture it. Let's say what it is. He was a dead man laying in a tomb, bound up by the cloth that had been wrapped around him, bound him in the spices that they used with the dead people. And there, now he come out and he looked like a mummy. They didn't wrap the legs separate. They didn't wrap the arms separate. He was bound up. He probably waddled out to Jesus. And you say, are you making light of a very important story in the world? No, I'm telling you that Lazarus literally had to walk out of that hole in that rock like this right here. And the Bible says that Jesus made a proclamation of freedom. You know, when we signed our declaration of independence, there were several men who scribed their name they were proud of the fact we are declaring our freedom, declaring our independence. We will sign it. John Hancock said, so they can read it without glasses. And he signed his name real big. Well, let me tell you this, my friend. There is a greater declaration of independence that you have the opportunity to put your name to this morning. Because Jesus said unto Lazarus or unto the people about Lazarus as he was now standing around he had been dead for four days his body should have been decaying he should have stunk and Jesus said loose him and let him go loose him and let him go you say, Jody, you don't know where I've been, what I've done, who I've done it with, and how long I've done it. That's right, I don't, don't need to know. You don't need to, this, I'm not a priest and I'm not behind a curtain. You don't need to tell me all that you've ever done. But what you do need to do this morning, my friend, is you need to come to the altar of God and you need to find Christ here. Not that he's lost, but he's here with outstretched arms. And you need to come and you need to confess your sins to him and say, I am a sinner that needs to be saved. I am bound up in my sins. I have been in this way for some time and I am none the better. You're like the woman with the issue of blood. You've spent money. You've read every book. You've tried every place and you can't get relief. Your life is no better. Finally, finally, you have come to church. And when the altar call is given, what you need to do is you need to forget about everybody else in the building. You need to make this a selfish thing. You need to say, I, I don't care if the whole world's going to hell. Me and my family, we're going to heaven. Amen. I don't care if everybody else says there's no need for Christ, there's no need for the church, there's no need to sing those 400-year-old songs that Ryan's only been singing for 40. 
We don't need that anymore. We've got a better way. We don't need it. That's antiquated. That's for grandparents. That's for them people who just don't know any better. They're too simple-minded to know the real truth. I'm telling you, my friend, Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man is going to come to God but by me. Now, he's the door, and you're either going to go through him or you're not going to get in. Amen? And so we have this morning... This declaration of independence where Lazarus said, was told, loose him and let him go. And I thought this morning, I'm going to get some rope. <laughs> I've got some rope out in my truck. You know, I keep that toolbox because you shouldn't drive a truck without a toolbox on it. People will think you're not a man. So i, I got a toolbox on my truck so everybody will know I'm a real man. What you don't know is if you were to get in there and see what's in that toolbox, you'll probably find that I'm, well, maybe not much of a man. I'm more of a dad, really, than anything. There's probably some baseballs in there and some fishing stuff, and I don't know how many tools, and if there are tools, I may not know how to use all of them, but at least I've got them, and if somebody who does know how to use them could say, hey, do you have one? Yes, I do. It's brand new. Why is it brand new? Don't know how to use it. I'll watch you and learn. I was going to go out there and get a big rope, and I was going to cut off some 20, 30 foot of that rope, and I was going to tie somebody up. But I was afraid it wouldn't be enough rope to go around Bob, and that'd just be embarrassing for me and him both. It's been a bad day for Bob. But let me tell you, in all seriousness, let's get back to it right here. We end in 30 seconds, and somebody's going to come and give their life to the Lord, I hope, this morning. But my friend... So get the invitation song ready. I surrender all, all to thee, my precious Savior. I surrender all. Set free. Lazarus was set free. The woman taken in the act of adultery was set free. Neither do I condemn you. Go. Go is a word of freedom. All of these people that have come to Jesus in the past and he set their hearts free. I'm telling you this morning that you woke up and you're bound in sin. You say, Jody, I, you talk about these sinners. I, I don't think I'm that bad of a person. That bad of a person goes to hell. Amen? You say, I thought only the worst. No, 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 no. I'm telling you, you need to come this morning and give your heart. Give your heart to the Lord and let Him save you and save you today. Because if He, if he saves you today, my friend, you can get up from this altar just like we seen the two souls last week that got up, and they, they might not have said it like this, but they could have said, I've been set free. I've been set free. And do you know what? For Jacob and Kelly, Jesus became their Savior last week, and you know what He is this week? Still their Savior. You know what He'll be next week? Still their Savior. You know what He'll be like 10 years from now? Still their Savior. What will it be like when they're old and gray-headed and about to die. I hope that's a long way away, but you know what he'll still be? He'll still be their Savior. Amen. Stand with us this morning all over God's house as we give somebody the opportunity to make Jesus